Welcome everybody coming on. We have just opened the doors to Aloha Rising, our webinar series here at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So we're gonna let people sign on. Also, as you start coming on, signing on in Zoom, if you wanna join us on Zoom, if you're on a social media site right now, uh, like Facebook, and you wanna come and join us in the Zoom room, um, go ahead and come to oha.org slash Aloha Rising. And you can join us there. And or of course you can join us, depending on what site you are watching on now. Oh my God, I don't have to. On the Office of Hawaiian Affairs <sighs> site. And Joel, if you can go ahead and mute Jason, thank you. So Jason, you're in um, already. And I don't see it showing up on Facebook yet. Mm. So I'm not sure the social media sites are coming online right now. Um, Jewel, can you double check if the cross posting is occurring? There we are. Okay, I saw myself on screen now. So I know we're in and I'll back up a little bit. From the camera, cause that's way too close. <laughs> All of you guys who are signing in on, on Facebook, go ahead and let us know where that you're checking in from. Yeah, aloha my kako everyone. I know we're supposed to have some guests joining us today too on Zoom. So if you're on the Zoom platform, let us know where you're coming in from. Know also that we will be checking the questions that audience members have on Zoom and also on the Office of Hawaiian Affairs Facebook site. But we'd like to aloha all of our partners out there who have cross-posted this webinar series. Again, I think we're in week three, four of Aloha Rising. We plan to do eight weeks, but we might just keep going. Hey, why stop a good thing, right? <laughs> oh, aloha to our ohana out in Molokai, out in Virginia and all the way in Kaimoki, Oahu. <laughs> Aloha mai. We have some ohana out in Portland, Oregon joining us. Um, I'm also looking on our, our Facebook site. We see some excitement out there that, of course, Governor John Waihe'e is joining us today as a guest. And as always, we will round out our Hour with Kumuhina, um, sharing with us Mele Aloha Aina, Mele Aloha Lahui. Uh, and if you guys have been following and practicing those Mele, you know, she'll go over them, you know, one more time. Uh, these are beautiful Mele, you know, and I think she has the same philosophy as I do. Anytime you learn a Mele from us, go ahead and share it with your families. Yeah, and use these mele. Aloha to our ohana out in Kailua. 
Okay. Glad that you guys all could join us today. And let's go ahead. Okay, okay. We're figuring out our, we have some technical interesting things happening uh, today. Oh my God, though. Who would have thought the first time we try to do it back in the office, it's going to be a headache. Right. You know, um, as, as Hawaii starts to um, go back to work, in in all of our spaces that we well by the way we've been working the whole time right so so don't get it twisted you know we know that there's a lot of ohana who have been at home um working you know and we'd like to you know mahalo mahalo everyone for for staying sticking through and oh right on with Kumuhina joining us. Again, aloha, Hina. Aloha. Okay. And if we are makaukau to go, you know, I just wanted to speak a little bit about our guest today. And um, let me talk to our, our back of the house tech people, if we can have everyone muted just for a second and we'll get right into this. Um, we do have a, a great show today, a great showcase of, of um, Hawaiian history, um, also connecting us till today. Um, you know, one of the goals of Aloha Rising is to have our Lahui um, fully aware of, of what our um, civic engagement um, history has been, you know, the history of our people actually um, getting civically engaged and um, and participating in the well-being of, of our communities. Yeah. So, you know, we have today a very um, the pivotal person in, in our history. The first governor right and and when we're talking about a, a a kind of more i guess a global context right we'll say he's the first indigenous governor um but here in hawaii in the 80s um when i was coming up through high school you know this is the the most the highest ranking hawaiian that we we had here um for many of us yeah so former governor john waihe started his political career as an activist during the Hawaiian Renaissance. He went on to become a delegate in the 1978 Constitutional Convention, where he and a handful of other Native Hawaiian delegates helped advance one of the most progressive state constitutions in the United States that codified unique protections of traditional and customary rights, water rights, and created the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Waihe'e then went on to elected office, holding positions as a House representative in the state legislature, then becoming lieutenant governor, and then became the first governor of indigenous descent in the United States in 1986. He would join Aloha Rising today, um, our campaign for connecting Kuliana to discuss the Hawaiian Renaissance and the organizing effort that took place at the 1978 Constitutional Convention. Uh, okay. Now I'd like to hand this over um, to Community Outreach Manager Davis Price um, to uh, further introduce our guest today. Davis? Yeah, I just want to add mahalo for that, Mihana, and aloha, everybody. Oh, great job, team, uh, managing through the technical difficulties. And I just want to... Um, you know, in addition to all those amazing credentials that you shared, um, I want to kind of shed some light on, and kind of recap what we've covered in this in this series so far. <clears throat> and um, we started out really talking about leadership and uh, the relationship between our leaders and the people um, dating back to uh, pre-contact um, 
you know, chiefly lines and uh, land use and governance and management of resources. And then we went on and, and you know, Commander Beamer came on and he talked a bit about, um, yeah, those management resources like the Ahupua'a system and the leadership that it took to create those systems um, of, that resulted in, in, in bountiful uh, uh, resources for our aina, from our aina and for our people. And, <clears throat> and then we went on and, and then he talked about how those pre-contact systems were incorporated um, post-contact even in our, our kingdom laws. Uh, and then Kavika came on last week and he again touched on leadership and engagement between leaders and our people um, in the, you know, the, the kingdom era, the post-illegal overthrow era, and even into the territorial era. And, <clears throat> and really locking in on the role that our leaders have in our community, the types of leaders that we look for, and that we, and historically, the types of leaders that have really been respected and beloved, um, and who have gone down in history as uh, achieving great things that is all reflective of what they have achieved for the people. Um, and, you know, there's been a real historical account from, from hundreds of years ago to 100 years ago. And now I'm really excited because we're going to talk about uh, leadership and community and the engagement between leaders and the community and organizing in, in an era where, fortunately, we have folks that were there um, to share and tell these stories and, and talk about the successes um, and even some of the failures. But really, today, I think we're going to talk about something that was a huge milestone achievement for our community and for Hawaii. And, and I just want to, and, and so I look forward to that. And just keep in mind that the theme of this show, as we progress to this discussion and this presentation, is really about leadership, what qualities we look for, how leaders engage with our community, and what the community's kuleana is to engage. The title of this show is Informally Connecting Kuleana, and that's what we're trying to do is, is connect those dots. So um, that said, I'll hand it off to the man of the hour today. And, and I would just add to all those amazing credentials that you shared, Mihana. Um, he's, what really excites me is he started off as a grassroots activist. Yeah, and, and, and he'll share some of that, but you know, running with some of the organizations, he's been telling me the stories the last couple of days, uh, the Hawaiians, the Kokua Hawaii movement, um, being one of the, the inaugural uh, graduates of, of William S. Richardson School of Law here. Um, and lending those services to the movement in supporting PKO, the Protect Koho Olave Ohana, um, and, and really how all of that movement progressed. So I'm excited, and uh, without further ado, mahalo, Governor Waihe'e, for joining us. Uh, take it away. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, hear how old I am. So I, I know that Aloha Rising is, is about uh, encouraging people uh, to um, participate in the uh, in the government or in the various uh, forums where uh, issues are being dis discussed and and the rest. Um, and oftentimes, when people do participate, because uh, you know it, it seems like it's a, a lonely process. You know, you're there by yourself. You, you might be the only person who understands uh, what the Hawaiian point of view may be. But today is about discussing uh, why it's important to participate. Because not only do you have a chance to express uh, something important, but because every once in a while, uh, instead of just having a seat at the table, every once in a while, you may get to own the table. You may get to own the table. And today, in a way, is a story about that happening. So if we can have the first slide. Um, it, it, you know, in 1968, 10 years before the 1978 Kong Con, which is the main topic of today's discussion, there was another Kong Kong. And so in a decade earlier, one of the delegates, a Hawaiian delegate, introduced a proposal to the 
to the um, con uh, then Constitutional Convention, which did something really uh, innocuous. All he wanted to do was to ask the state to preserve and enhance Hawaiian commission, Hawaiian condition. And instead of getting uh, support, uh, he was greeted by mild, uh, I guess you would call it abusement. And he was actually forced to stand up in the convention and defend this proposal as not, it was not a laughing matter. Can you imagine that happening in Hawaii? Well, 10 years later, the con con that we are going to talk about with all the Native Hawaiian provisions happened. What happened in between? First of all, can we have the next slide, please? This happened in between. There was an explosion across Hawaii right after 1968. And you see uh, Waihole, Waikani, Kalama Valley, and the rest. The 1960s was a time when the, um, it was a time for tremendous change in Hawaii. In fact, you know, one of the interesting statistics which I was looking at recently is the fact that between 1950 and 1977, just before the uh, 1978 CONCON, the, the population of Hawaii grew by almost 80%. And as a result, there was development, there was things going around with statehood came uh, a boost in, uh, the, in development and tourism and people were expressing dissatisfaction. And um, may I have the next slide, please? And the reaction to that is what you see at this, 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 this on this slide. At the University of Hawaii, people were uh, getting caught up in the Vietnam War, which was a very unpopular war at that time. And not only were they having protests against the war at the university, one of the little known facts uh, in Hawaiian history is the fact that the Hawaii National Guard was constantly getting called up to go and fight in Vietnam. And guess what? They protested. They said, this is unfair. You know, why should we keep going? And that protest was led by two young Hawaiians, uh, Henry Peters from Waianae and, um, uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, other people. And at the University of Hawaii, we also saw young people demanding that they wanted to know their history. They wanted to know their, what, what their uh, heritage was all about, our history, our way. This was the excitement that was starting to be generated. And uh, Larry Kamaka Viva Oli became a symbol of ideas at the University of Hawaii expressing all the people of Hawaii. In the middle of all of this turmoil, Bishop Estate starts sending out evictions, 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 and it starts at Kalama Valley. And as a reaction to this, people started to say, no, no, I won't go. And that was done and the, an organization called Kokua Hawaii was started. About the same time, the people in Waiholi, Waikani uh, started to wor worry about H3. Can you imagine? H3 was already starting to generate its, it, its, uh, its legacy. If you think the rail is going to take a while, uh, H3 started way back then, and they said, no, you're not going to build a highway through our valley. You're not going to do it through Mauna Loa. You're not going to displace farmers. There was a, a, a opportunity to develop, and they were taking water. About the same time, the, the United States started to send money to Hawaii and the federal war on poverty programs, model cities, OEO. And they stress something called citizen participation. You, the best people to run a program are its beneficiaries. And so 
people, young people right across, or people in general, right across the state, and particularly in places like Waimanalo, Waianae, and the Hawaiian area, started to say, you know, if this is true, then why aren't we running the programs that are supposed to be laid out for us? And a group founded called the Hawaiians, and much of the same people that, began, that were part of uh, Kukua Hawaii and Waiholi Waikani came together and said, Hawaiian homes, we should, do, we should be, have a strong voice in. And just so you know that all of this is not political, they, they started to also find their way back into their culture. And I can remember people like Sam Lono. Sam Lono, I, I don't know if anybody remembers him today, but he was a kupuna who went into these uh, political activities and said, you know, this is all part of our culture. Other groups followed. The Aloha Movement, which was started by a lady called Louisa Rice. And what she was about was that um, uh, she was about learning about, well, at that time, the Alaskan natives had gotten reparation, reparations and lands back. And she said, if they can get it, why can't we? And then they went and did research and they discovered the whole controversy about quote unquote, the ceded land. And, this, and the belief that they started, they, they started telling people that ceded lands are Hawaiian lands. They were stolen lands, not ceded. They were not given to us, they were taken from us. And so these things, these people began to come into the mother. Why aren't we doing, what's happening to ceded lands? How is doing? In 1974, the first purely Hawaiian protests uh, on purely Hawaiian issues occurred in Parker Ranch on the Big Island. And the, the Hawaiians and all of the allies, people that are all part of these, their various organizations, went up to Waimea on the Big Island and looked across the pasture lands and said, that should all be Hawaiian homestead. And the first person to cut the chain open the gate and have the protesters walk in was a member of the organization called Joe Cassidy. You know, these are people that, that put, their, uh, put everything on the line. Meanwhile, uh, the, the Bishop of State Trustees was one opening up in the early 70s and the first, and instead of appointing a Native Hawaiian, the courts then appointed uh, someone else, of a, a, a Nazi Takabuki, as a matter of fact. And that triggered off the formation of the Congress of Hawaiian Organizations. Why aren't Hawaiians involved in the governance of their own trust land? Where are we in this whole scenario? And one of the founders, by the way, was the same James Bacon that we talked about earlier. And in the milieu of the idea of taking control of our own resources, doing our own lands, the next obvious step was, hey, how about some, as we now say today, how about some political muscularity? You know, I think that's how you pronounce it. And, and we started the Home Rule Party. And people met at Lily Okalani Trust. And we talk about this is not about Republican or Democrat or anything like that. This is about Hawaiians and Hawaiian issues being standing up. Fred Cachola was uh, stuck with the idea of, of being uh, one of the chairmen for all of this. You, you need to know, folks, that for many of us, much of what people take for granted in today's Hawaii was not available. Any young person today in a week could learn what it took us months to go and research and find out about our history and ourselves. But the one thing we knew was that we were not going to stand and watch things happen. And so the Huli signs went up across the nation, starting with Kukua, Hawaii, to the other half of the Lahui, uh, uh, Home Rule Party, all of it. And at the same time, there were individuals <clears throat> who were starting to discover that not only were we a nation, 
we actually might have some legal basis for doing that or restoring that status again. And people like Kawai Puna, regime, so many, uh, you know, started to talk about that's and and uh, deal with went to actually connected with the mainland uh, Native American lawyers and say, how do you get where you are? What can we do? What's indigenous rights? But he didn't stop there. He went on and uh, started to do uh, discover our international connections started to talk about the idea of international rights and, and the rest of it. And Bukai uh, Bershwitz, I remember he, uh, he called a little meeting of the law school, school uh, Hawaiian law school, school students and suggested to them that Ooh, this is a real thing. That, by the way, those kinds of discussions led to the founding of the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. Just so you know, it was not all of this politics and this self-discovery. It was also about the time that the Polynesian voyaging society was starting. You see, one of the things about this particular assignment today and its time constraints and technological constraints is the fact that um, this is just a tiny slice, this whole discussion. Is, is but a tiny slice of the, what we now refer to as the Renaissance. It was so much richer. There were, there were things, el, uh, uh, other things going on. Larry Kimura was talking about restoring the Hawaiian language and he was joined by uh, a, uh, uh, Kaunoa uh, Kaman, Kamana, Kamana and her husband, and many others. Sam Lono was, do, was doing that way back when. At the same time, the hula was take, being coming back. You know, the hula was, was uh, can you imagine, there was a time when most, when, uh, when Hawaii, very few men knew how to do the hula. Very few men knew how to do the hula. And even the hula kahiko. And in the 70s, those things were being discovered. And all of a sudden, there were men dancing. I, I, I got to tell you, I, it, it was an amazing time. So this is not all about politics. This, there was an amazing time when, uh, I remember there was this group called um, Nakiona Mana, Nakioni Mana, I think, the gentleman. And uh, they had a great song, uh, Moko Kai Kala, Moko Kai Kala. Yeah, it was about the motorcycle, you know, and, and all of that. And they started bringing, there was a nightclub that they had them in uh, uh, Kapahulu, and they started bringing in male dancers and wives and girlfriends and everybody were hauling their reluctant husband to go see these half-naked guys dancing. You know, it, 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 this was an amazing time. And not only politically, but culturally. But the one thing, one common element was people were rising up and talking about things that were important to them. And one day at the law school, we got a visit by a gentleman from Kona called David Mauna Roy. And he started to talk to us about a place called Koloko Hanakahau. And he told us this was a sacred place. And he asked us to help him. And what we were talking about is the idea that all of these efforts that Hawaiians had been involved in was more than just economics or social development or even cultural awareness. It was spiritual. There was an aspect to all of this which bind us to the Aina. And so the beginnings of what is now the Koloko Honokahau National Park began, largely as a result of his efforts. And that same kind of thinking was also being carried out in Molokai and across the state. And they said, if the Aina is so special to Hawaiians, 
why are we staying, standing by and allowing an island to be bombed, an island to be destroyed? And the protect Ka'o, Ka'o'olabi Ohana began. And we, and leaders like George Helm stood and said, no, stop it. And Walter Riddy, Emmett Aluli, so many others, and they, and they, they, the feeling went across the entire state of Hawaii. You know, th these were extraordinary people. And all through this, by the way, I, I just wanted to make one thing really plain as I sit here and I reminisce. And that is that there were so many great Hawaiian leaders, hundreds of heroes. And people today, you really ought to talk to your family members. They, they might be a hero sitting next to you and you don't even know it. I, I remember speaking to, uh, Professor uh, now uh, Andrade, Troy Andrade at the University of Hawaii Law School, telling him what a hero his grandfather was, Pai Goldera, for what he did with the, uh, with, uh, the Hawaiians and, and the like. The point I'm making is that there were all people going out through all of these things, uh, many of the same people. And the Poteka Ho'olabi Ahana uh, was special. Why Holy Waikani with Pete Thompson and the rest. And you know, one of the well-known members of the Ohana besides George, who had the most beautiful voice and, and he was the most articulate speaker. He reached back in the middle of the 70s and reached back to a lady called Frenchie de Soto and Henry Peters who had been protesting uh, National Guard in the very early 70s and said, I would like to address the Hawaii State Legislature. And the Hawaiian politicians of those days, led by Henry, insisted that that happen. And for the one and only time that I knew of, both houses of the legislature came together and listened to George talk about Aloha Aina and the cause of Kapu'ola, you see? And there were people like Walter. There was nobody that knew how to live on the island like he did. I remember we'd sit in meetings and they'd be talking about, oh, you know, how we're going to go, we're going to plan the next invasion and do all of this. And somebody would go, hey, Loretta, where is uh, Walter? And she would turn around and say, you know, he's already on the island. <laughs> This was an age of learning, an age of commitment, an age of rising up. And there was Ahmed Aluli and his negotiation skills. All of this came to a head at the Constitutional Convention of 1978. And let's have the next slide, please. These are just two gentlemen. Sonny Kaniho with the Hawaiians, George Helm, as just two people who are representative of the hundreds of heroes that participated in that movement so that what we take for granted today, like our participation in government, like our uh, rights and the rest of it uh, is made possible. Next slide, please. And as a result of all of this, when we came to the 78 Constitutional Convention, things happened. Water rights were, this, were, were established for Hawaii, for all the people of Hawaii. And it was made an obligation of the state to protect it. It was the creation of the Water Commission and, and, and the like. And that came out of the white, holy white county struggles. You see, each of these amendments that that we talk so much about is the Hawaiian amendments had a genesis in the Renaissance you and I were so briefly chatting about. Next, uh, next slide, please. The Hawaiian homestead lands, the Hawaiians, and they are, their involvement in 1974 with the Parker Ranch lands, which by the way, I should be happy to report these years later, as a, as a result of Sonny Kanihu's efforts and the like, 
There is a parcel in, the, in Hawaiian homes on that land where the chain was cut and the people arrested for entering, whose homestead, where the homestead owned by a Kanif. And all of the things, I'm, just, I'm not going to go through each of these provisions, but I wanted to let you know that 1978, 1974, the Hawaiians laid the foundation for the Hawaiian Homestead Amendment. Next amendment, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Obviously, I, there were other milestone amendments, the creation of the Hawaii Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which sprung out of the work of Gail Pergine and others who said, you know, if we're gonna, we're gonna have to, uh, an opportunity to run our own affairs, then we should be able to do it. And they created an office that, whose legitimacy was based on the fact that Native Hawaiians were gonna be elected by Native Hawaiians. They also followed the, uh, the, the Aloha movement and said, why not? They need resources, why not get it? from the ceded lands revenues. Prior to 1978, all the revenues that were generated on ceded lands were being dumped into the general fund and reappropriated to education. The justification for the Hawaiian part of that was that, uh, you know, Hawaiian kids needed education as well. Traditional and cu customary rights. That came out of the Kaho lobby the Honokahau experience, where people uh, you know, wanted the ability to practice their culture in a way that was not restricted, that large landowners couldn't cut them off from. This is sort of an interesting thing because the, the Hawaii Supreme Court had introduced the idea of access rights uh, with regard to beaches and saying that you can't cut people off. And that was for the general public. And the Ohana and others said, yeah, well, we also need it for us to do our practices. One of the most uh, 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 cont contentious amendments in the Constitution had to deal with adverse possession. We don't talk about it much these days, but back in the day, you know, every Hawaiian family had a story of some land, large landowner taking over their lands. And of course, we know all about the language and the educational system. I was talking a little bit about that when we were doing, describing on the Renaissance. What is really interesting about this whole effort, interesting, is the fact that the requirement that the state has, and it is a requirement, to promote the study of Hawaiian culture, history, and language in the public schools actually came from a, the Education Committee of the Constitutional Convention. It didn't really originate in the Hawaiian Committee, which uh, actually which, um, was uh, promoting making Hawaiian language official. See, these, so you start with the Renaissance and the Huli, and all of a sudden, Bam, here we are, Julia, the whole direction of the state has changed. And people had to deal with it. So why did that happen? 1968, Renaissance. The next thing that happened, next slide too, is the Constitutional Convention itself and what happened there. And this is a chart comparing the 1968 and 1978 constitutions, cons, uh, conventions. And in 1978, what I used to like to refer to as the 30-30-30, was some very interesting statistics. First of all, we had more delegates. Secondly, uh, in 1968, it was mostly elected officials. I think in, 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 in 1978, there were only four in the, in the whole convention. There were more women. There were also more people born outside of Hawaii, which begins to give you a sense that Hawaii's population may be changing. When one of the most interesting uh, statistic of all is that a third of the convention 
were 30 years old and younger. So this was a young people's convention. And what's one statistic that you don't see up there are the presence of Native Hawaiians. Where are they? Well, actually, I don't have the statistics really for 1968, but I know in 1978, maybe it would be lucky if you could have counted a dozen Native Hawaiians in the entire convention. And if you look at the next slide, which gives you an idea of who the members of the uh, Hawaiian Affairs Committee were, look very carefully. I think you'll only see there are about six, six Native Hawaiians. So for those of you that participate and get into, you know, get into decision-making positions now, if you think you were, if you think you're lonely, then you ought to have been at the 1978 Constitutional Convention. What happened? What happened to take advantage of the uh, the, 19, uh, the Renaissance? Well, I tell you, one of the most important things that happened was Frenchy de Soto. You know. As little Hawaiians as they were in the 1978 Kong Kong, what most people don't know is that they were probably there were only two Hawaiians that would have been considered activists in any of those earlier uh, groups that we had talked about, and that was myself, and I was a junior member of all of that, and Frenchy de Soto, who had become known. Uh, for her work with the Poteca Olavi Ohana. And not only was Frenchy an important part of this whole effort, but also the, the first thing that she did was she became chairman of the committee. And the first thing is that she took ownership of that committee. She, this was not a chairman who's going to sit around there saying, where are my votes? This is a chairman who's going to make votes happen. And uh, her, one of her vice chairmen was a former basketball player from the University of Hawaii. What a great guy. And he uh, was part of the Fabulous Five from the University of Hawaii. He's also a member of the HGEA, John Pennybacker. He actually volunteered. He wanted to be her vice chairman. And he wanted people to know that if you ever talk stink about anti Frenchie, you're going to have to deal with John Pennybacker. Of course, we had Leo. Leon Sterling, who was Native Hawaiian, but all of them agreed to, that Empty Frenchy begin to work her magic. And the first thing that she did, the first couple of things was she did was she, first of all, she got a great support staff. And if we can get the next uh, slide, please. Uh, and her staff, th these are people that when we talk about what, the Hawaiian products at the, at the, uh, that came out of the Concon, most of us don't even know who they were. Her number one staff member was a guy named Steve Kuna, who had just graduated from law school. He came in to uh, help her. He must have been, he and this, uh, uh, her, uh, the other person that she hired, Martin Wilson, who went on and worked in some Hawaiian agencies and stuff, both of them spent hours actually researching, writing, doing things, and they were being led by two lawyers, Sherry Broder and John Van Dyke. I tell you, Hawaiian people really ought to feel a lot of aloha for John Van Dyke. And, and there was also Melody McKenzie. Melody, Professor McKenzie was actually the lawyer for a different committee in the CONCON, the executive committee. But she was also there working on this. But see, Frenchie didn't stop, stop at her staff. Frenchie also invited in people from the community. She invited in the activist movement itself to be part of her committee. Georgiana Patigan was the chair of the Hawaiian Homes, Department of Hawaiian Homeland. Georgiana wasn't sitting in the corner someplace wondering what they were going to do about 
uh, her agency and how the Hawaiians would react to it. She was a member of the Hawaiians. She was part of the group. She sat in Frenchie's office almost every day and uh, talking about ways to improve Hawaiian homes. And she also brought a lot of beef stew, by the way. She used to bring, <laughs> that was, hey, Frenchie's place was where you wanted to go to eat. It was food all over the place. Wainona Rubin, the new executive director of Aluliki, to working to uh, upgrade Hawaiians would be part of the volunteer staff. They were, they, these people were willing to get their hands dirty. Walter Ritty, good old Walter, left the island, came to Honolulu and helped empty Frenchie walk around and take up papers and getting signatures and, and persuading people why the Hawaiian amendments was good. Were not only good for Hawaiians, it was good for all of us in Hawaii. The Kalahiki brothers, Randy and Mel Kalahiki, who were part of the Waiholi Waikani struggle. They and Charlene Ho, who was a delegate, actually created the momentum in the Konkan about the necessity to uh, protect water rights. Who can forget, if you were there in those days, Francis Kauhane. See, he could smoke in the building in those days, and I can just see Francis sitting in the back of the room with his cigar, standing in the back of the room with his cigar, watching everybody. And if anybody said anything that had the remotest, um, remotest sense of derogatory, uh, anything derogatory about Native Hawaiians, you know, Francis would make sure you get a little cigar blown in your face, you know? And Cully Watson talking about how housing may be done. Auntie Frenchie had a tremendous support staff. Auntie Frenchie invited all of those groups that we discussed uh, earlier. And together, they began to evolve proposals to be considered by the Constitutional Convention. And they didn't even stop there. Auntie Frenchie ran her committee. She ran her committee differently. You didn't go into anti Frenchie's committee and said something about, I like Robert's rule of order. Shall we I'll move the previous question? Let's take a motion. Let's, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's vote. You went in that committee and anti Frenchie's rule was we all agree, we all agree or nobody leaves. You see, the second part, building on the foundation of the Renaissance, the second part of what happened of the Con Con was this persona and all of these Hawaiians coming together and taking advantage, owning this committee and ultimately owning what was happening in the entire convention. Next slide, please. I know we are running out of time. So, I was gonna, oh, this is just, uh, I have to throw this in so you know that we were all young ones. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the last piece of all of this. In order for this to happen like it did in the committee, we first had to have a committee. We first had to have, a, uh, uh, we first had to take on the structure of the entire convention. And here, you know, the funny thing about Hawaii was that when we passed the, the idea that we should have a convention in 78, in 1976, nobody knew why in the world we were supposed to do that. There was no real issue that they thought about. The people were, were talking about crime and the rest of it. But all of a sudden, the constitutional convention. And so the pro conventional wisdom coming out of those that know how to do these things was that there were two approaches to a constitutional convention. One, the constitution should only be about structural matters. Structural matters meaning executive, judiciary, legislature, and all of that. There was a minority point of view that said the constitution was an opportunity to set policy. In order to make some relevance, to make the constitutional convention relevant, what happened was that the newspapers got involved in the whole thing, the media. 
and the advertiser would, would promote us. They both were, by the way, the both newspapers were, um, were, were conservative approaches, only structural changes. And the only structural changes they could come up with at that time, which was popular in the continental United States, was pro, was initiative, referendum, and recall, direct citizen participation. And uh, so that would, that generated people who ran for the CONCON because they thought that that ought to be done. And the generation of uh, what we called IR and R generated the opposition, which was that business, union, political parties. Most people who were already in the establishment said, we don't want the right democracy. So they became the anti R and R. And for the longest time, people classified the two groups as the only convention. Well, little did they know that there was a small group of delegates who thought of maybe there's a third way. First of all, the convent, the constitution definitely ought to set policy. That if we're gonna restore Hawaiian things or even ec ecological of the rest, they needed to be stated in a way. We can't wait on the legislature. And the second thing was that we were anti uh, IRNR. In fact, most Hawaiians were. And one of the most articulate speeches I, I heard about on this issue was from a gentleman from Waiholi Waikani, Pete Thompson. And he stood up and he says, you know, in Waiholi Waikani, we are stopping this development and the rest. And the way that poor people vote is with their bodies. I can promise you that I can get a thousand people around the Capitol, but I can also tell you that a thousand votes is not going to win an initiative. And we were also pro environmental protection and Hawaiian rights. And what happened basically is that we began trying to create a different way between, instead of the first two divisions. Now, the first step in any CONCON con is to get organized. And as typical, the anti-RRNR groups, which are the establishment, knew what to do. And they uh, put up a candidate for the presidency of the CONCON, con, a gentleman called Bill Pate. And, you know, and the other group, did what normally people who not that well organized do, they just floundered around. They couldn't come up with, an, with, a, with, a, with a candidate. I remember getting a call from one of the unions, one of the very important unions, uh, HGEA, and who was actually a client of mine. I was a labor lawyer, who was actually a client of mine and who was led by a native Hawaiian, uh, David Trask. And his staff asked me to say, we want you to support I are, and we want you to support Bill Patey for president. And I told him, who in the world is Bill Patey? And he said, well, he's the manager of the Wailua Sugar Plantation. And I was paused, and then I thought to myself, there's no way in the world my father would turn away in his grave if I vote for a plantation manager. And so a small group of us, the third way, as I like to call us, actually began by opposing Bill Pady's election. We began by opposing Bill Pady's election. Halfway through the whole mess, what uh, while we con con couldn't get organized because neither of the groups could get together more than enough votes to organize. You needed 52 votes to organize. 52 votes to organize the con con. They couldn't do it, and our group shrank, shrank, shrank down to seven people including myself, Frenchy De Soto, and five other delegates. And then one night I got a call from Jeremy Harris, the future mayor of uh, Honolulu. And he said to me, John, we decided, and this is the anti, I mean, the pro initiative group. We decided that uh, we're gonna back your, uh, we're gonna make you president of the CONCON. And I said, really? I said, Jeremy, the problem is you could probably elect me, but the next day you guys wouldn't know where you are. So I came back and told uh, Auntie Frenchy and the, and the others uh, that, you know, they were saying this. And I said, they said, what is your answer? I said, I don't want it. 
I never wanted it. Uh, who, you know, president has to be worried about things like paying staff and doing the rest of it. And they said, what should we do? And so Auntie Frenchie looked at me and she said, I want to tell you a story about Bill Patey. And I said, what? She said, Bill Patey's grandfather stood with the queen. <laughs> what? Yeah, the Patey family took it in the teeth because they supported the little colony. And I said, you know, call your friend David Trash and tell him we're ready to come on home. And next slide, please. We made a settlement. <laughs> and the newspapers called it the concessions to the youngest set. They created two new committees in the uh, 1978 Constitutional Convention, Environmental Protection, Hawaiian Affairs. And they asked, and they told me, because I was the negotiator, what in the world, what do you want? I said, nothing, just the opportunity to name officers, chairman, and members, which we did. And then all of a sudden, that's Auntie Frenchie became uh, hit, uh, chairman of the Hawaiian Affairs. We picked our members, we did all of these organizations. But what we still had was a bunch of delegates, most of whom had never been in, uh, in, in this kind of situation before. How do you do it? The next step was organizing the place. Organizing meant we creating something called the captain system where we allocated people, delegates that were willing to work. We organized them into being responsible for a number of people so that every single day we could know what the support level was for any of our proposals. And it allowed us to allow people to vote no on something and still win. And so that's the next, so first of all, hold out, you get recognized, you, be, you leverage it, we organize, and then we have to identify who's our foes and who's our allies within the delegates. There were many people who were for IR and R, but were also for Hawaiian affairs. So while we held tight on that issue, we had to court them back on the other issues. And the same thing, vice versa. There were many people who were pro, uh, you know, anti IR and all that might not have supported us. So we had to work with that. And in that identification process, we also begin to discover that outside the com outside in the regular community, we in addition to the Hawaiian Renaissance, we might have some other allies who came through for us sometimes. People forget that in the 1970s, the two most powerful political leaders both had names named Trask. Tommy Trask with the ILW and David Trask with the HGEA. And while they might not have been on the forefront of activism, they might not have even put up, they might have even thought some of our ideas that we, thought we brought out might have been crazy. The one thing they did was once we passed it, their unions made sure that they supported us, you see. In order to do all of this and make some sense, what was absolutely needed was, some, was a unifying team, a theme, something that said what we were about, that this was more than just about, just about this project or that or fixing this or fixing that. There had to be a kind of a philosophy. And so what we talked about, what we tried to develop, what we were trying to express as a group, as a third way at this constitutional convention, was the ideas that Hawaii was more than just something you would call a special place. It was indeed special. That these islands affect each and all, all of us. It was the beginning, it was our attempts to very, in a way, almost kindergarten-like, describe what today I hear young people calling aina aloha. The idea that there is a value 
that for a thousand years people have learned in these islands and they mean something. The idea that here is a place of limited resources, that here is a place where you have to meet, live with your neighbors, here is a place that was special. As opposed to the, the continent, which had so much space that if you didn't like the people you were living next to, you go west. Go with someplace else. And there's so much water that you can divert it. There's so much, you know, this is different. You can't apply those values to Hawaii. Some of the people called that Palaka power. Some of it did everything. Some of them, a lot of people, you read the newspaper report said that that was racist. But you know, the origin of all of that was really our attempt at something very Hawaiian. Next slide, please. If you, this is the most important, if you really want to understand the, the Hawaii State Constitution, you need to take a look at Article 11, Section 1, Article 11, Section 7, Article uh, 12, Section 4 where it talks about a public trust, where it talks about all public resources in trust for the benefit of the people. This idea of a public trust, where there's an obligation, not you can't, it is you're obligated to protect water. It is a, it is a trust when you talk about the revenues and the use of ceded lands. And it is, and the key word on that article is the word and. These ideas were not plucked out of the air. These ideas were, got, were gotten. The whole genesis of this was gotten from a series of Supreme Court cases that had been decided by the Supreme Court of the, Hawaii, uh, of, of the state of Hawaii who the Chief Justice was William S. Richardson. And he reached all the way back to the law of the kingdom, actually before the law of the kingdom, to the days even before that, and brought it forward and said it is applicable today. So the foundation of the 1978 Constitutional Convention was the Renaissance. And there is nobody that can be better called the mother, not only of OHA, but of the Hawaiian amendments than Frenchie de Soto. But I tell you, the kahu of this constitution was Chief Justice Richardson. And last slide, please. As an expression of what I am talking about, I, I would like to call your attention to the preamble of the state constitution who were written, was written by three of the youngest members of that convention. And they, none of whom were Hawaiian. And they were trying to express what it is we were trying to present. And they started out with these words, that mindful of our Hawaiian heritage and uniqueness as an island state, we reserve the right to control our own destiny, our destiny to nurture the integrity of our people and culture, and to preserve the quality of life that we desire. You know, what was interesting about this is that every time they wrote it, the editors would add S's after culture and people. And what these young people finally came in to me to say was, hey, John, tell them stop doing that. Because what we are trying to say is that this aina creates a people and creates a power, a, a culture, that all of us, all of us share in the need to correct injustice to Native Hawaiians. All of us need to correct what happened to the plantations when they borrowed the slaves holding systems of the South that all together we can create something bigger. And it is a people committed to Hawaii, one people, one culture. 
And that was the 1978 Constitutional Convention and the Renaissance of the 70s in as short a period as I can make it. Wow, man, amazing, uh, Governor Waihei. Mahalo nui. Uh, that was phenomenal. And, and I know how much work you put in to condense that uh, into a, a few minutes. And everybody, yes, we're, we're going over it today, but I think it's uh, very worthy of this time that we're, take, that we're sharing. Um, so I have a, a few questions, and we, we've only gotten a couple questions uh, that have come in. Um, and one of them asks uh, if, if we are witnessing a second renaissance. Um, and, and I want to kind of ask you to provide, you know, provide a bit more context for that. Um, you know, what, what do you see as a parallel potentially today, what's happening today between what you just described, which was in, in some massive uprising of, of the community of the people in various efforts and kind of converging upon this opportunity that was presented with the CONCON and, and really trying to address or fix some of what the, the unrest was about. Well, right? it, I tell you, I think that uh, we are entering a time of the same kind of dissatisfaction. And maybe the hidden blessing in this uh, whole COVID-19 um, situation is that it's forcing us to reevaluate our value system. And one of the one of the things, one of the differences, maybe between not maybe it, one of the differences between a continental perspective and a Hawaiian perspective is the idea of, of benefits. That what might be beneficial to people in general on the mainland may not be beneficial here. And every time we have a new project or a new something happening in Hawaii, uh, people always present it as uh, being beneficial. That's why we want to do it. Government thinks it's beneficial. That's why we should do it. And we never ask the question, beneficial for who? We never ask the question that in the last 30 years, why is it that more Hawaiians are starting to live on the mainland than here? Why is it that more people born in Hawaii are starting to live uh, on the mainland, uh, on the mainland, uh, you know, on the continent than here. And um, these kinds of fundamental questions are, are I think, triggering a reevaluation uh, of where we are. Uh, you know, I got to tell you one thing about the Hawaiian provisions of, 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 the, con of the 1978 Constitutional Convention. Um, it was done at a time when we didn't have as much knowledge as the youngest person uh, that can run this computer has now about Hawaiian and Hawaiian culture and, and, and the rest. And so a renaissance right now would be building on a great foundation. In, um, and, and I think we see this being expressed. We see this being expressed uh, at, on Mauna Kea, for example. Um, uh, whatever we think, about uh, whether the actual, uh, the actual project should be done or not done, you got to, when you, when you are in my shoes, the fact that you hear people speaking Hawaiian, doing what they're doing, and the whole world tapping into what they're doing, you, 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 gotta, you gotta say it's worth something. I mean, my parents spoke Hawaiian all the time. Uh, and Sam Lono spoke Hawaiian, but nobody else, well, none of us, the generation we described, that the, uh, the heroes that I described, what we were dreaming of was the day when uh, maybe that would happen. My God, yeah, and I, get, I think- And I think... by the way, the aloha, the aina aloha thing, which I stole from this little presentation, to me, is trying to accomplish this. You know, that's what we, in a way, we were searching for. We were searching for not a list of projects, right. not ultimately. We were searching for the gem of an idea. And it was an idea whose time has come. And that's what uprisings are about. Yeah, and, and I want to say, like, I, I believe that there are uh, uh, striking similarities between, especially when the way you explained it with kind of giving a snapshot 
of all the activity that was happening. Um, and, and, and really, I, I know in dynamic that's different, and, and my perception is, is you know, the CONCON sprung out, it was really looked at as an opportunity. Unfortunately, we're, we're dealing with a, a crisis and a pandemic um, that people are struggling with, and, and we have to acknowledge that. But it's also, it's, it's forced us, it's forced everybody to kind of take a, a hard look at some of the things that Hawaiians have been um, very ma'a to. Yeah, have been yeah. very uh, familiar with and have been saying, calling for changes that have now been forced upon us. So yeah, how are we and it's for the good of all Hawaii. Right. You know, our people were trained for a thousand years what's, what the Aina needs. <laughs> That's why, you know, Kamana's uh, uh, presentation was uh, so important to me. But anyway, I don't want to take Hina's time. Yeah, I, I want to wrap up with one more quick question, though, because, and, and I'm going to try and, it's actually like three questions, but I'll try and tie it all together. You know, when we were talking about this and we were going over the presentation yesterday, you said that your folks' approach going into the CONCON was that the law and policy was already there. We just, oh, yeah. had, we just had to yeah. make it better. Well, what I want to say, which I've said over and over again, and, and, and what I was saying is that people often come, well, you Hawaiians really made out at the 78th Constitutional Convention, you know. And I tell them, hey, you know, there's nothing that we did in 1978 that we didn't, we weren't already entitled to. Nothing. Hawaiian Homes was already a Hawaiian, uh, a Hawaiian program. What we needed, what we needed for it to happen was for it to work. You know, ceded lands and ceded lands revenues, quote unquote, was already designated to Native Hawaiians. What we needed was for them to get it. You know, and even the idea of an election of Hawaiian leaders, you know, that it was no more than apple pie. That's what everybody was saying, that you need to be a beneficiary's control. By the way, we already had a Hawaiian-only election with, with Aloliki. You know? So yeah, I, I, it, I think it's a little bit uh, disingenuous when people who want to make divisions in our society try to make it look like Hawaiians took something that they weren't already entitled to. And, and, and uh, I think that point needs to be made as real clear. Right, and, and I, would, I would say that, um, and in wrapping this up, you know, how I see it is, is, you know, it's really a phenomenal to look at all of the amendments that were made and then we could talk for hours more about how that constitution led to a number of statutes that were passed. Uh, you know, like such as the creation of the Water Commission in the, in, you know, several years later. And, and it was a building block. It was a building process. Yeah, so here's a text to Charlene Ho for the Water Commission. Right, right, right. Uncle Cal and to Charlene. Absolutely. Uncle Cal, Uncle Cal, yes. And, and, and I think that if we recognize that these are, it's a building process, that maybe it's time for us to start lifting the bricks again, right? And start yeah, building. But we recognize that the law is there the policies there, the or institutions are there, but for some reason, they're not following the law. Why yeah, is that? I was saying, we had a dream, and I'm gonna tell you, it's, I, you know, in, in one way, it's exciting to see things that you dreamed about happen, like the language being spoken more and more often. In another way, it's kind of like a nightmare because what you meant to happen is not even close to that, has been subverted by, uh, by things that, uh, you know, we built around it to make sure that it never quite made it. Uh, you know, one thing, one quick statistic. When, after we, after 1978, this little bit of history, after 1978, we passed the, the idea of OHA and the like, and that was, unfortunately, we still believe in the legend, you know, so it, it, they, the legislature had to produce uh, a statute to implement OHA. And what was what little people know is that when they got done, actually that statute was initially uh, written to try and uh, clip the wings of OHA. It, it was you could see it was a cutback. And what the historical part I want to tell you about is there were about five or six legislators who were delegates in the Constitutional Convention, who were sitting as representatives in the House of Representatives 
when that statute, the first statute that created OHA came hit the floor. And all of these delegates who were supporters of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs at the convention voted no because the statute that was passed by the legislature over their no votes was not representative of what people really wanted to have. So we have work to do. We right? do. And that's, that's the takeaway. And mahalo again, I, I think how you framed, uh, you know, described Nancy Frenchy as, as really the boss of that, of that committee and, and the driving force behind the community and getting the community engaged in the process. I, I think it was an invaluable lesson there. Um, an invaluable blueprint for how we, if, if the community can get it, it can, can get organized. And we know that there's organizing happening in pockets, but what's missing is that convergence. And if we can make that convergence happen collectively, then we just need one anti Frenchie. <laughs> yeah. Right? But we, we get yeah, a lot of anti Frenchie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, mahalo, uh, mahalo for everything that you've done and, you know, and uh, the Hello. foundation that you've laid and the great work and for taking the time to share today and, and become a and, and learn quick on this Zoom platform and and the, and the slides and what so mahalo nui. Yeah, mahalo again, um, Governor and, and Davis, mahalo for um, fielding those questions and, and engaging. You know, Governor, that was the, one of the best um, presentations I, I've seen um, in a long time. Um, and I think it'll resonate with the work that we got to do now, you know, just connecting those dots um, from past to present. Oh, I don't want to take any more time away from that. I think in the future shows, we'll, we'll, we'll keep coming back to... Um, this this particular you know presentation that you did today to to reflect on um, when we talk about future steps and talking about the future let's um, get Kumuhina on Hina um, Lemoana if you can come on and and help our our audience out there uh, learn some new mele or review some some older mele that would be amazing but again i can't say enough how much i enjoyed that presentation um governor wahe mahalo nui thank you for that i i mahalo nui ya e mihana mahalo nui governor wahe uh mahalo nui kokaku hui ana mahalo nui ya oko keki pa ana mai wa uno ke okumuhina uh Kea no kakako manawa e no no opono aku ai no kea muaku he he ala ana kako kea no ka manawa e ku mai e na kanaka rise up stand up my fellow Hawaiians ku mai a na like kako the time to act is now when it comes to saying well what can I do you might say well who am I I'm not anybody special and I will say back to you, neither am I. But together, you and I, we will make a difference. Part of making that difference today, folks, uh, again, as we have reviewed Mele uh, over the course of our last few sessions here online, these Mele are intended to do what we know needs to be done. We heard Governor Waihe'e speak about this earlier. And that is to affect and impact the mindset and the heart set of our people. And when Governor spoke about whose importance, uh, the benefit of things that we do here in Hawaii, whose benefit is it too? Is it for the benefit of people who live on the continental United States? Notice I said continental United States. For every time we review a mele that I compose, you must absolutely remember that our Pico is here. So I'd like to urge all of you out there in viewer land to start addressing our homeland in its rightful way. And that is by calling our Hawaii, our mainland. Hawaii is our Pico and Hawaii is where we must focus all of our attention and our heart. Next screen, please. <clears throat> I dedicate this to all those of you who have come before us, those who fought for 
representation, those who fought for our people to have what little we, we might feel we have now would have not have been possible had it not been for people to stand up for us back then. And what does that mean for our future? It means that we, we have the perfect opportunity to consider how you and I will impact our own next generations in these days ahead. <clears throat> I dedicate this melee to all of you. Um, maybe if I could enlist the support of either Mihan or maybe Davis, um, is either one of you able to uh, kokua me in the interest of, of time? Um, let's see if they pop back up. There you go. All right. So I'm going to uh, give you the Hawaiian and immediately after that, Mehana is going to read to you um, the English so that we can just go back and forth. Keyano, Keyano Kamele, Hemele no Nakoa, Aloha Aina, E Aloha E Anau. I shall honor, love, and cherish. E Ku Aina, Ku Woneha Nau. My land, my birth sands. Nokaho Oilina Naku Puna. For the legacy of the ancestors. E Payomau Anaue Kapono. I shall fight and defend in truth and justice. Next slide, please. Nakaua e kuulahui. It shall be you and I, my beloved nation. E paapono e paai kahoe uli. To hold fast to the steering paddle. Ahoyaku hoya hoya mau. Let us paddle onward and forward. Ahikiloa ikayo kamaluhia. Until we reach the shores of sanctuary. Ahikiloa yahavai inuyakea. Until we reach Hawaii of the vast expanse. E o Hawaii, e o la mauloa koi noa. Answer, o Hawaii, long live your name. Now that, folks, is the chorus. And moving on to verse 2. E mahalo aku i kalevalani. Let us give thanks unto the heavens. I a nani lua ole, nani kupa yanaha. For this incomparable and astonishing beauty. He lei po in ole, no na kaua kau. It is an unforgettable lay for all of life's seasons. It is the lay, the never-ending love for my land. Next slide, please. May my flag wave proudly evermore. The proud symbol of the Aloha Aina Patriots. Velo i Mauna Kea, velo i Mauna Pani au. Fly proudly from Mauna Kea to Mauna Pani au. Aku kahi mai a ho'olo kahi ho'i kakou. And let us now unite and stand as one. Oh yeah, mahalo. No leila. <clears throat> and I believe... Uh, this... Oh, you know, we should, we should do this more often. I like that, that little... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mahalo. I, I enjoy it too. I enjoy it too. Because you know I mean our viewers in the audience, I don't think they want to hear me just talk all the time. So Oh no, they can't. They can't. You would love that. Mahalo. I was hypnotic, you guys. You too. <laughs> Mahalo. Okay, thank you next time. Okay, thank you. Mahalo. Here we go, everyone. Um I will share this melee with you and don't forget. When you tune in to our upcoming episodes of Aloha Rising, we will review these mele. So don't feel too bad. Um, I know that you can rewind once we're done with the show and you can go review the mele for as much as you want. But um, I will share with you this mele today. Once again, I dedicate it to all of the Koa Aloha Aina in all of their diverse facets that they have and continue past and present, and for the future of Koa Aloha Aina, this mele is for you. E aloha e anau i kuu aina kuu o ne hanau no ka hoilina Kupuna 
e pai o mau anau e i ka pono na ka ua e kuulahu i e pa a pono e pa a i ka hoe uli a hoe a ku hoe a Oe a mau, a hiki loa i kai o ka maluhia, a hiki loa i a Hawaii nui a kea, e o Hawaii e o la mau loa ko i noa. Mahalo aku i kale alani Ia nani lua ole nani ku hai anaha Hele i po i na ole no na kau a kau Kale o kuu aina, kuu le ima, he ole chorus. Na kaua, e kuu lahui, e paa pono, e paa i ka hoe uli, a hoe a ku, hoe a hoe. Ahiki loa i kai o ka maluhia Ahiki loa i a Hawaii nui a kea E o Hawaii e o la maolo a ko i noa E velo mau loa kuu hae Hawaii Kale paha a heo na ko alo a aina Velo i mau na kea, velo i mau na pa ni au A ku kahi mai a ho'o lo kahi ho'i kākou Nā kāhaua e kū lāhui E pā'a pono e pā'a i ka ho'e uli A ho'e a kū, ho'e a ho'e a mā Ahiki loa i kai o ka maluhia Ahiki loa i a Hawaii nui a kea E o Hawaii e o la maola kou i noa E o Hawaii e o la maolo a kou i noa. No leila, e kalahu i aloha. E like no me ka olelo kaulana o ki e ke ia hi meni. E na ue i mua e na apo ki i a inu i kuai ava ava. E vivo ole a ho o kupa a a o he hope e ho i mai ai. A na i vale no ka kou kou koe mau i ke ala. Aue ke aloha ole a kamali hini. Forward, forward, young brothers and sisters, and drink of the bitter waters. Be fearless and be steadfast, for there is no turning back. Let us overcome and surmount all challenge that lays in front of us and move straight down the path towards victory and success. For alas, the time of the foreigner presiding over our affairs is now over. What will be the fate of 
the Hawaiians? What will be the fate of our people and what will be the fate of our next generations? My fellow Kanaka, you decide. That is a choice for you and I to make and that choice is upon us soon. So get active folks, be out there and know the issues and know the options ahead of us. Keloha nui ya uko, mahalo a nui no ko uko kipa ana mai i kuu wahi manawa o ke ka ana anaku i a wahi mele. Mihana, back to you. Aloha. Oh, yeah, mihana. Yeah, no, mahalo, mahalo, mahalo hina. Um, again, amazing. Only you can teach mele like that um, so quick. Um, Davis, anything yeah, that you want to update? Go back to the um, slide. Uh, just so, so you, again, reminder, um, kind of synthesizing everything that, that is being shared with us every week about organizing leadership and the role of our community to activate and and the various ways that we can be um, active. You know, voting is the one simple way um, for all of us to engage. You know, I love what we're talking about, what, you know, um, you know, Kamana and, and, and Kavika last week and now Gabway Hey has shared is, is how much work happens on the ground to really affect change um, in our communities, the organizing, um, how, how leaders come to, how they ascend to leadership roles is based off of people. Right, and and so I, I I'm I'm gonna share again the re, the weekly reminder about mail-in voting. Joe, can we get the slides back up, please? And but I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that uh, we gotta work in our communities. We have to identify who the leaders are, and and support them, and 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 work amongst your brothers and your sisters and your ohana and your cousins and and your extended friends and family and 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 really. Um, the simplest way to be engaged is to talk story. And right now, I think there's a lot of common denominators that we have where we can talk about the important issues and, and identify that we're, we're in alignment. Yeah, we know that um, our food systems need to be fixed. We know that tourism might, it, 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 something has to change. And that's a starting point. We don't need all the solutions in all these conversations. But if we can identify that we want the change and, and, and we need something to happen um, to affect that change. It starts with those kind of conversations. Um, and the simple way to exercise your, your voice calling for change is to vote. And this year we'll be voting by mail. There will not be precincts um, like we're used to. Uh, you will receive your mail in the ballot with the registered, but you must be registered by July 9th um, in order to receive your ballot in the mail. So we're encouraging everyone to visit our website, oha.org slash vote. And that will, that'll take you where you need to go in terms of getting to the, 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 uh, the voter registration site. And then you'll see some other helpful information such, such as this next slide that um, kind of just paints a picture of what uh, voting looks like now. There, there's a couple different envelopes you'll get and, and there are some security measures that are, are, are being taken to ensure your, the privacy of your vote is protected. And I know that a lot of folks have questions about, you know, what, how, how the votes are being processed, how the ballots are, are being processed and, and will be processed. And I have similar questions, but I would like to remind everyone that um, for the last five years, about 50, or sorry, last 10 years or so, about 50% of the votes in Hawaii are submitted via mail. Yeah, so this is not a brand new process that we have to, you know, uh, we should definitely question and make sure that there are mechanisms, security mechanisms installed, but it's not completely brand new. And about half of the voting populace in Hawaii has already been partaking in this process of voting by mail. And, and it creates a lot more access. Um, 700,000 registered voters in Hawaii, we need to get more registered. But in about, you know, most the last few years, a uh, few election cycles, about 380,000 to 400,000 people vote. Out of 700,000 who are registered, out of a population of 1.2 million. So when we hear about the majority and the majority decides, I believe firmly the majority does not decide. And the silent majority is actually who will affect change. And that is our kuleana to get involved. Um, and, and, and voting is one easy step. Thankfully, there's a lot of leaders in our community and a lot of great organizations who 
who are working to tackle some very tough issues. And I think that their time to rise and shine is and, and shine amongst our people is now. So get ready. Like I've said in the first episode, it's time to get it on. So uh, mahalo again to Governor Waihei. I think he gave, kind of shared a blueprint for what can happen when the community converges and, and really says, we're going to do this. And now might be the time for, for something like that to happen. So keep tuning in. Keep talking story. Make sure your family and friends know about the voting deadlines. And um, yeah, mahalo nui. Back to you, Nihana. Mahalo, mahalo. You know, just another reminder, this Saturday at 6 p.m. on KGMB, um, we will be having our um, fourth, fifth episode, fourth episode of, of Olaka Haloa. Um, and this week we feature um, Dr. Kamana Beamer talking more about the Aina Aloha Futures um, Endeavor. Gov talked a little bit about it. And if you tuned into Kanai Okana this morning, you heard Joshua Nanakila Manuel talk about it and also Dr. Kamana Beamer um, from Hawaii Island. Both of them was 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 queuing in from Hawaii Island um, with that talk. But you'll hear a little bit more, you know, um, so we can offer a perspective on that. You'll also be hearing from Dr. Aukahi Austin Seabury, who is one of our Native Hawaiian clinicians, um, just to talk about some, you know, some strategies uh, for, you know, how we deal with what's going on today. Uh, and then we'll hear from two pa'ahau, right, the pa'ahau issue and, and the idea of justice in our communities um, you know, have, have been an ongoing topic, uh, not just during this time of COVID, but to hear about the extra kind of struggles that are going on um, right now. And then we feature a newly released um, video from two award-winning um, Native Hawaiian musicians, uh, Sean Pimentel and, and Lehua Kalima, that they dedicate along with a bunch of their friends, um, who are a bunch of our friends, uh, other talented Native Hawaiian musicians, giving a, a kakao and, and shout out to all the graduates, you know, who are graduating this year, class of 2020, um, from all over. So join us this Saturday, 6 p.m. on KGMB. Of course, join us next week right here, same time, same place, uh, Thursdays, 2 p.m. Um, here at oha.org slash Aloha Rising and also on, on the Facebook channels of, of OHA's Facebook channel and all of our partners. Okay, so from all of us here um, to all of you out there, e kalahuie aloha kako, ahuiho. Aloha.